Okay, so that's just an introduction into some of the proxies we use, how we find out about past climates. So what we're going to do now is go on and look at some examples of that. And the first one we're going to do is look at really long-term climate change, so over millions or tens of millions of years. Okay, so this is one of these plots. So this is an oxygenisotope plot, okay, of things that have been precipitated in the ocean, okay, and it's kind of a, a global compilation. So it's make measurements from lots and lots of different places. And what this basically shows us is that, you see we've got uh, the axis here is flipped upside down, okay, and um, you can see here that the time is moving in the correct manner from old on the left to young on the right. So quite often geologists plot this the other way around because they want the numbers to increase. Okay, because that's the way Excel plots numbers. But this is the correct physical way of measuring time when time proceeds to the this way. Um, but what we can see here is that throughout geological time, we've gone through cold periods. So we're in a cold period at the moment. Okay, we've got ice sheets at the poles. You go back in geological time, there are some places where it was a lot warmer. So this was kind of like uh, the end of the Cretaceous when like, dinosaurs were kind of like having a big party thing. Oh, it's going to be fine. Um, and then there were colder periods, warmer periods. And we went through these cycles of cold and warm periods. Okay? So one of the questions is, what is driving these really long-term changes in the state of the Earth's climate? Okay? And this is important because you know, whether we have a, a climate that stays kind of like cold or stays warm or oscillates from one state to another is important for basically changing the environmental conditions, which is important for driving things like evolution, which you might have covered previously. OK, so one of the hypotheses uh, is uh, related to continental drift. So you should have done something about how kind of like the, the continental plates move around uh, in Earth dynamics. And the thing here is that if you have continents that are on or near the poles, okay, it's, easy for you, it's easier to build up a large ice sheet. And the reason that is because the continents are basically the land is higher up. And the higher up you go in the atmosphere, the colder it gets. Okay? So that means that it makes those regions essentially, the surface of the earth in those regions, colder and it would allow you to build up ice sheets. Okay. So we've come up with now a hypothesis, which is that when the, the continents were over the poles, so this is basically a paleogeomagnetic uh, kind of like reconstruction of where the pole was, um, when those were over the poles, we should have the cold periods. Okay. So we can actually go to test this hypothesis. So this is kind of like we can look at the late Carboniferous. So this is one of the cold periods, and we can see that we've got an ice sheet. Uh, so it's kind of like a cold period, and we've got continents that's kind of over the South Pole here. And if you look up at the Lake Jurassic, which is one of the warm periods, you can see that, that the pole is not really covered by a continent. Okay, there's a little bit up in the north, but not, not much. Okay, so this kind of fits our hypothesis. So the Jurassic is warm, Lake Carboniferous is very cold. Uh, it's not cold for us, because we're kind of like in here somewhere, right? Or over here. Okay, so we're in the equator, so... Just think about if we found some rocks and measured the proxy from, from Scotland, uh, we'd think it was very warm. But in fact, the whole globe is cold. OK, so that's great. So that means that we've got a, a theory which we can, we can show kind of like works. But we have another yeah but here. We could go to another time. OK, so this is the Eocene. This is one of the warmer periods of geological history. And uh, we have big continents over the pole. OK, we have a little bit of an ice cap, but... Okay, we have a very warm world. So this is a case where we it doesn't meet our expectations. Our, 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 our hypothesis has Okay, so we could go through a whole bunch of different times in geological past and say, well, do we get big ice sheets? Okay, and are the continents on the poles? Okay, so if we if if this matches this, then our hypothesis is good to go. And that works in some places, but not others. So that means there must be other things that are controlling whether it's hot or cold. Okay, so uh, we've got our equation here. Okay, so we've been basically talking about whether you get ice sheets. And if you kind of like follow some of the discussion on the discussion board, you say, well, if you have an ice sheet, that's going to increase the albedo. That's going to give us a, uh, uh, keep our planet cold. Okay, because this is going to uh, be a big number. 
this will be a small term. Um, so it looks like that that presence of ice sheets is not the thing that's driving this long-term climate change, or maybe it's not the only thing that's driving it. So have a think about some of the other parameters in this equation. We can have a look at the emissivity or the absorption. Okay. So the thing that we think about with, with that is the carbon cycle. So just a, a quick cartoon of the carbon cycle. So you've got carbon in the atmosphere, and that's the, 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 basically the part of the carbon cycle that matters for climate, because that's the bit that's doing the absorption of the long-wave radiation. But it's actually a small component of the climate system compared to where the other part carbon is also the deep ocean. It's got loads of carbon in the deep ocean. Okay? Rocks have got almost an infinite amount of carbon. So if we start to transfer carbon from, say, rocks into the atmosphere, okay, that could have a potentially very big effect on radiative transfer balance. Okay, so we could we can start to try and kind of like understand all of these different fluxes and, and whatnot. But the important thing is that the flux in and out of rocks to the atmosphere is very small flux. Okay, so it's a very so if, if you if we basically if we stopped kind of that transfer of carbon overnight, it wouldn't make much difference the next year to the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. But over very long geological time frames, this, 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 these, these small fluxes can make a, make a very big difference. OK, so this is what we're going to be talking about uh, uh, for the rest of the lecture, is this, this how we transfer carbon from minerals into the atmosphere. And if you've watched the video, many of you did not watch the video. Um, if you watch the video, this will become easier. This is basically the, 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 the ultimate message, is that when you do kind of weathering of rocks, that is a series of chemical reactions that ultimately takes carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, okay? And then it, you have some weathering reactions that happen that cause some ions to form, okay? okay? Including ones that contain carbon. And those ions go into the ocean, okay? And then stuff happens, okay? So this, 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 this is not entirely complete because when calcium carbonate precipitates out of the ocean, we actually release some CO2 back into the atmosphere. Okay? And if you watch the, uh, the video, this will explain why. Um, so the reason I made the video is because I noticed that this slide here was horrendous um, to look at if you don't know lots about chemistry. Um, so if you don't know lots about chemistry, watch the video. Um, but essentially, uh, we've got three things to think about here. Carbon dioxide isn't just CO2. Okay? When it basically comes into contact with water, okay, so this is in rain or in rivers or in lakes or anything like that, uh, we form carbonic acid, okay, which releases hydrogen ions. And it turns out that in the ocean particularly, okay, most of the carbon is stored in this form here, this bicarbonate form. Okay? Um, and then the thing about these reactions here is that it really does matter what kind of rock is involved in the weathering. Okay, so if you've got calcium carbonate, that reacts with this acid, okay, and dissolves it. So acid dissolves rock, it's like rock, paper, scissors, that kind of thing. You get these ions formed, and that removes CO2 from the atmosphere, okay, because this is not a gas. Okay, problem is that when these ions reach the ocean, calcium in the ocean and this bicarbonate react together or precipitate whenever a, an organism wants to grow a shell. Okay, it produces carbon dioxide. Okay? So the weathering of carbonate rocks does not remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Okay? Uh, weathering of silicate rocks, however, and there's these longer equations here, turns out that every... So this isn't an actual... Well, this is a mineral, calcium uh, silicate. This is actually, I think, perovskite. But that's irrelevant. Don't write that down. Um, it's just a chemical approximation for all silicate rocks. Okay? Kind of similar to a, plagic, uh, a pyroxene, but that's also irrelevant. Um, but when you kind of weather average silicate rocks, for every one mole of rocks, you need two moles of CO2. And when all these elements eventually get to the ocean, you only give out, again, one CO2. So there's a net removal of carbon dioxide when you weather silicate rocks, but not when you weather carbonate rocks. So um, the other thing to point out is that... Uh, wait, Oh yeah. So the, the other thing to point out here is that, that that weathering rate, okay, is dependent on 
you know, the climate. So if you're somewhere where it's very hot, very wet, rocks will weather faster than where it's cold and dry. Okay? So there's basically a climatic effect on the, the rate of weathering, um, and also uh, when you kind of start to grow plants. Okay? So the more plants you have, the more soil there will be. Soil basically concentrates carbonic acid into the soil, so that makes it, the weathering go much higher. Okay, so this is a really important concept, and I'm glad I've made it to this part before the end of the lecture. Um, in this, this, this concept of what a feedback is. So if we look at what might happen if the climate got warmer, okay? So if the climate got warmer, okay, we would increase the temperature, right? Kind of self-evident. It would rain more because there'd be more energy in the atmosphere to evaporate water. And we'd probably then get more vegetation. Okay? All of these things would increase the amount of chemical weathering. Okay? Now, globally, okay, there are both carbonate rocks and silicate rocks. So even if you know, some weathering was happening on carbonate rocks, some were happening on silicate rocks elsewhere, and we would then remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Okay? Now, that would then make the planet colder. So that basically um, reduces the initial warming. Okay? So this has had a moderating effect. Okay? So we've, we've basically had a, an initial change, and then the weathering cycle has basically kind of stopped that change happening to its full extent. Okay? So this is called a negative feedback. Okay? Uh, likewise, if you cool the planet, you get, it would be colder and drier, we'd have less weathering, okay, so less CO2 would be removed, more would be left in the atmosphere, so that would allow for a little bit of warming to counteract the initial cooling. Okay? So this is opposite to the effect of ice sheets. So with an ice sheet, it gets colder, you have more ice, you have more albedo, okay? that means the planet reflects more energy out in space using that equation that you should all know, so that would increase the amount of cooling. So that's a positive feedback. So whether it's a positive or a negative feedback, it got, doesn't matter whether it's warming stuff up or cooling it down. It's its effect on moderating or amplifying the initial change. Okay? Um, so looking now at kind of the long-scale carbon cycle, so CO2 comes basically into the atmosphere ultimately from uh, the deep earth, so mid-ocean ridge spreading, and volcanism, that gives CO2 to gases up into the atmosphere. So this can be thought of as a forcing, because this is not dependent on climate at all. So if we start to increase the rate of volcanism, okay, we have more volcanic activity over long geological timescales, this will increase the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. So this could be something that's driving our long-term climate change. Okay? But what could be reducing CO2 over a long time scale? So one thing to think about is weathering. Now, another thing that can affect weathering, so we said temperature can affect weathering, we said precipitation and the amount of vegetation, that can affect weathering. But also, if we got our rock and we broke it up into lots of smaller bits of rock, okay, it would, like powdered it, for example, it would have a much higher surface area. Okay? So that means that weathering reactions could happen much faster. Okay? So one way that we can do this kind of geologically is by erosion. So this is actually just the physical breaking up of minerals into smaller bits of mineral-y stuff. Okay, so if we have, uh, and that erosion happens uh, where we have steep slopes, so in mountains, okay, doesn't happen so much in kind of flat-lying areas. Um, so if we have mountain uplift, we have all these kind of processes that happen in geog geog geography lectures, um, and that gives us a, a much bigger surface area. We increase our weathering rates and we remove CO2 from the atmosphere. So if we have some event that builds an enormous mountain range, okay, that will actually have the effect of cooling the climate. Okay? And that's a climate forcing because the building of the mountain range has got nothing to do, climate doesn't cause the building of a mountain range. Okay? Or well, it does, but that's for like a master. Um, so this is kind of a nice example here. So this is the uh, early Permian. Okay, so this is kind of a cold period. And as you can see, just after 
kind of this continent, which I forget the name of, and this continent up here, which I think is another one I forget the name of, but it doesn't really matter. These have just hit each other, okay? Enormous great big mountain belt, okay? And not only is it an enormous mountain belt, but it's also a mountain belt that's on the equator, okay? Which we know is a warm, wet place, okay? So that means that this mountain range here will be uplifted, we're having lots and lots of chemical weathering because we're grinding up the rock into very small pieces because it's lots of steep slopes. So this is a time that's actually cold. Okay, this is here. Look at this cold bit here. So now we've got weathering and mountain uplift, or mountain uplift and then weathering, is maybe one of the drivers that's causing these, these changes in global temperature. Okay, you can also look at kind of this period up here. Think about that. So this is here now, and actually, we think, well, are there many big mountain ranges here that could explain that cooling at the, uh, when are we, the end of some uh, early Cretaceous? And actually, I mean, there are some. We've got a long mountain range over here, got some mountains over here. So it's possible that this could be causing it, but then it's not really convincing evidence. And, and I guess we're probably going to have to stop very soon, but um, I really want you to get the idea that that when we're trying to answer questions like this in geology, there's never a convenient right answer. It's really annoying. Okay? Uh, there are a number of hypotheses that, or mechanisms that we can use to explain, you know, it might get cooler for, you know, because we've got a nice continent over the pole. That might be adding a little bit to the cooling because we can make some ice over that. Uh, or we could have um, mountain building. Okay, mountain building should cause cooling, but maybe not in every case. Maybe, maybe this mountain range here, this mountain range here, is not is basically spread out north south. Okay, so not much of it is at the equator. Okay, so maybe the the, the grinding up of rock that happens up here and down here doesn't result in that much uh, chemical weathering. Okay, because it's too cold up there. I mean, another thing you might think about with this diagram is that actually, so I mentioned earlier that you know carbonate weathering. That draws down CO2 out of the atmosphere, but then gives the CO2 back up again into the atmosphere when, when you precipitate carbonates in the ocean, when you grow shells. Okay? So that is true, but only once those two processes are in balance. Imagine if you, if you did a lot of weathering of carbonate rocks, you draw CO2 in the atmosphere, put that stuff into the ocean, but then it takes millions of years for that to be precipitated out of shells. Okay? So there would be a slight imbalance then, so that carbonate weathering would actually cause some cooling. Now, if you look at this map here, you can see that there are loads and loads of really big, shallow seas all the way around the tropical regions. Okay? So that means that we'll be promoting the formation of shells, of coral skeletons. So we'll be precipitating much more carbonate out of the ocean than we might be at another time in geological time. Okay? So that means that maybe at this time, the input of calcium, the input of, of bicarbonate into the ocean from weathering, is not enough to counteract the removal by, um, by precipitation of shells, which means that that means that we'll be actually adding carbon dioxide into the atmosphere at this time. Okay? Which might explain why, although this is a cool period in Earth's history, that immediately following this there was a, a rapid warm in temperatures. Okay? Because maybe the carbonate production here... So, so it's kind of counterintuitive. So you're basically... The ocean is connected to the atmosphere, okay? So CO2 can dissolve between the ocean and the atmosphere. And we're precipitating shells, okay? Which are made of carbon, calcium carbonate. We're taking those out of the system, but actually that might be causing the CO2 concentration to rise, okay? It's weird, but it is in fact true. Um, okay, so maybe this rise here, this rise here, is because we, we're precipitating these calcium carbonate and releasing CO2 into the atmosphere. Okay? But there are lots of other competing hypotheses. It could be that we you know, melt that ice sheet for some other reason. Okay? We stop supplying moisture to the southern uh, continents. Okay? So